So I'm going to discuss a uh, general approach to the poison patient. So just a kind of an introduction in terms of like poisoning epidemiology. So as many of you probably have heard, um, po poisoning deaths is kind of a public health crisis of, uh, of a greater or lesser magnitude, depending on who you ask in the United States. So by um, 2008, uh, poisoning had actually exceeded motor vehicle accidents as the most common cause of injury-related death in the United States. And in 2010, there were about roughly 38,000, 40,000 or so deaths related to poisoning in the United States. And the, most of those, about 78%, were unintentional. And um, as probably many of you have heard, based off of, uh, uh, based off of news media reports, most of those deaths uh, involve actually pharmaceutical agents and opioid analgesics being the most common. 75% uh, of those deaths that involve pharmaceuticals are actually related to opioid analgesics and 30% involve benzos. So very common in, in uh, poisoning fatalities and very common is like uh, co-ingestants co actually. Um, and as far as like risk factors for fatal overdose, men are about two and a half times more commonly involved in fatal overdoses than women, and people between the ages of 45 and 49 are uh, displaying the highest death rates as far as uh, fatal overdoses go in the United States. So the main thing is poisoning is an increasingly common cause of death in the United States, and it's most common cause of injury-related death in the United States right now. So the thing is that um, poisoning is like a, poisoning, if you look at it overall, it's a very high incidence, but relatively low case fatality uh, rate. So the reason why the number of deaths is so high is because there's so, so, so many poisoning cases or no exposures, and most of them um, end fairly well for the patient. But just given the overall sheer volume, even though the overall case fatality rate is low, poisoning is like a, a high incidence, uh, low, basically low, low overall case fatality rate type of clinical entity. And the reality is that most of, the, most of those deaths, um, you won't see them because most of those people are basically, they're found dead at home and they never come to the hospital. They, they go straight to the morgue and they get entered into the, you know, a CDC database and the CDC publishes the statistics. You will see some of the cases which are potentially salvageable, meaning that the, the patient has, as, as is common with poisoning, they have time, they have time limited organ dysfunction. So their organ dysfunction is typically mediated by a pharmaceutical agent or some agent that can be eliminated from their body provided that you provide supportive care and support their liver function, kidney function, and support their organs of elimination. Usually they'll get rid of the toxin, the organ, the organ dysfunction will resolve, they'll get better and they'll go home. So as long as they don't have really bad secondary injuries like anoxic brain injury, these patients are going to do rel relatively well provided that you provide them with meticulous supportive care. So. Um, as far as the general approach, as, as you might have gathered, the institution of, of appropriate supportive care measures is kind of the central theme of uh, poisoning management in the ICU. Um, toxidrome recognition and poison, identifi poison identification is kind of a big part of it as well because it helps you institute appropriate supportive care. And sometimes focused antidotal therapy will be appropriate. Um, the reality remains, though, that there is a very small number of poisons that we actually have effective antidotes for, and for most of it, it's going to be meticulous supportive care, which is uh, our forte in the ICU. So as far as like what relevant patient history you might want to gather when you're dealing with these patients, um, obviously it helps to know what the agent is and the route of exposure, whether the patient was exposed by inhalation route, whether exposed by a dermal route, uh, sub-Q or intravenous exposure to the drug. Um, what was the timing of their exposure? How many hours ago were they exposed? So for th some things like acetaminophen, we have very good tools for risk stratifying them based off of what time they were exposed. So if you have an acute acetaminophen overdose and you know it's been X hours since they took their overdose, we can risk stratify their risk for um, significant liver injury very well. Uh, for other agents like hydrocarbons, we know that if you have uh, inhalational um, if you have an inhalation exposure to a hydrocarbon or a hydrocarbon uh, aspiration, we know that the patients who don't develop significantly respir significant respiratory symptoms within six hours or so, they tend to do very well as well. So we have some poisons which have been reasonably well studied and have risk stratification tools based off of timing of exposure. Uh, same thing for tricyclic antidepressants. If you don't, if patients who don't develop significant cardiovascular instability or seizures or neurologic manifestations within six hours of their exposure, 
they also tend to be pretty loud. So also in addition to timing and uh, the uh, agent if known, you also want to obtain um, history regarding what do they have access to. If you don't know exactly which agent you took, you can ask what do they have access to, what over-the-counter drugs were in their home, what, are, what herbal preparations, supplements, alternative remedies are they using. And of course, in gathering this data, the patient may be altered and unable to provide you with much history. So collateral history from the family, uh, EMS, or the pharmacy records of their filled prescriptions is going to be very helpful. Um, that's a, that's an, a one that's commonly forgotten. It's very easy to, if you know that they have pills that they get from, from Costco, or Walgreens, or whatever, just call them. They have a pretty good database and tell you this is what they filled. As far as like uh, initial care, there's like a mnemonic that uh, we were taught when I was a fellow that's, uh, and we used to tell the rotating residents to think about using in order to formulate their plan. So as with most things, airway, breathing, circulation, we, we talk about as uh, our initial supportive care measures. But beyond that, um, the D uh, for disability is essentially uh, think about their neuro status. And uh, Beyond evaluating their neurological status, the, the, more, the more pointed aspects of the D part of the mnemonic as it pertains to toxicology is this do the don'ts. So if you have a patient with altered mental status, uh, check blood glucose, administer dextrose as appropriate, consider naloxone if there's signs of opioid toxicity such as pinpoint pupils or bradypnea present, and uh, give thiamine, uh, especially to our alcoholic uh, patients. So do the don't stands for dextrose, oxygen, naloxone, thiamine, and decontamination, which we'll talk about uh, uh, in, in detail in a little bit. The E stands for environment and enhanced elimination. So poison patients can be hypothermic. They can be hyperthermic. So make an assessment as to uh, environment and temperature dysregulation if present and manage appropriately. Enhanced elimination in terms of like uh, dialysis or other te techniques to remove toxin from their body we'll talk about in uh, in additional detail. F stands for focus therapies, which are antidotes, and the G is for get help. So if you have resources available within your institution, such as a pharmacist or a toxicologist, which you have here at Loyola, uh, it helps to involve them. And if you don't, then there's always your state poison control center to get help from. So we'll talk, this is very, real, very briefly. So, I mean, in terms of airway breathing and circulation, there's a variety of toxins that can cause a variety of disturbances in terms of your heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, um, uh, and, and, and so on. So uh, there's, there's this, this part is uh, a little bit less important because essentially uh, we'll t hint in more, um, we'll talk about things in, things in a little bit more clinically relevant way when we talk, talk about vital sign disturbances as they pertain to toxidromes essentially. So. So the summary for this would be patients with toxin ingestions can have a variety of disturbances in their heart rate, blood pressure, and respiratory status, and stabilizing their airway, breathing, and circulation is going to be the first steps, which you guys already know. So in terms of the, the D part of it, which is the do the don'ts and decontamination, so once you've made an assessment as to their neurological status, if you have uh, patients with altered mentation that's potentially attributable to a toxin ingestion, then when appropriate, uh, administering dextrose, naloxone for patients suspected opioid toxicity, and then of course thiamine for patients who may have um, malnutrition or alcoholism should be, should be part of your first line therapies. Uh, it, beyond that, this issue of decontamination often comes up. So decontamination in the world of toxicology has been performed using a variety of techniques. So everything from gastric lavage, which is where you put a large bore tube down the esophagus into the stomach, and then you use a, uh, usually it's like a, a hand-driven pump to put, uh, to put uh, warm uh, saline or warm water into their stomach, and then will try to air suction out whatever is in their stomach has been employed in the past. Uh, activated charcoal administration has been also uh, touted over the years as a means of performing decontamination. Activated charcoal binds to a variety of uh, organic toxins and hopefully prevents their absorption into the bloodstream from the GI tract. Um, the issue is that uh, the issue is that uh, none of these therapies has been really shown to uh, significantly alter the clinical course of a poison patient, and they all come with certain risks. So 
you might be asked, like, you know, who would, you, and this is still like that test question that pops up, like, who would you perform, like, oral gastric lavage at? I have never done oral gastric lavage at anyone, not as a toxicology fellow, not in the ER. And the reason why is because um, even though there is, even though there's uh, very little data to support it as having any efficacy, uh, expert opinion still recommends that oral gastric lavage be considered for patients who present within one hour of ingesting a toxin for which supportive therapies are very difficult to perform. So like uh, I, a perfect example of that is if you have somebody who massively overdoses on um, like a chemotherapy agent or like colchicine, things which have multi-system like organ toxicity because they're cellular toxins, it's very hard to provide supportive care for a toxin that's going to damage their liver, their bone marrow, their kidneys, their heart. Um, those patients are, if they have a significant ingestion, they're going to die no matter what. So expert opinion still posits that if, they, if you present within, you know, one to two hours of a, of a toxin for which supportive therapy is very difficult to perform, uh, that you consider doing oral gastric lavage on that, provided that they have a secured airway. The problem is that nobody ever comes within one hour after they take anything. That's why, even as a toxicology fellow, I, I, I never did it. I think I recommended it a grand total of like once. There was a patient who had taken like a, a huge overdose of tricyclic antidepressants and they they supposedly came within one hour. So I think I recommended that one time. If you, could, if you guys have a secured airway, patients intubated, consider doing this. And that's the only time. So so that, that's, a, that's a testing answer. If they ever ask you like, who would you do oral gastric lavage on? But you should realize there's no data showing it changes the outcomes. And um, it's just expert opinion. Recommendation. And if there, if it's been more than an hour, uh, it's not really recommended anymore. But so that's oral gastric lavage. So charcoal, which is much more germane, because you will be faced with situations where you're being asked, should I give charcoal or should I not give charcoal? Or the patient is in the unit now, and it's like, should I give them a dose of activated charcoal? So activated charcoal is is a therapy which actually has been studied reasonably well in recent decades, or actually I should say over the last 10 years or so, people have made an attempt to study charcoal in a systematic fashion in, um, in, in predominantly resource poor environments. So like Sri Lanka and India and places like that where relatively resource poor environments, places which have high rates of um, suicidal poisoning essentially with relatively potent toxins. And they have attempted to study if in a randomized fashion, whether it be giving people charcoal or not, changes outcomes. They haven't really found that to be the case. So why should we give it? Well, again, you're faced with the question of an uh, agent which is, has a relatively fewer risks associated with it versus oral gastric lavage. Oral gastric lavage is a risk of, pretty significant risk of aspiration, esophageal trauma, including rupture and perforation and things like that. Uh, whereas activated charcoal, your predominant risk would be aspiration. So what happens if you aspirate charcoal? Uh, you can get acute lung injury, and there are chronic sequelae of, of charcoal aspiration. People have reported things like bronchiolitis obliterans and things of that nature as well. So essentially, you're, you're, you're going to be faced with the idea of, of, should I give this thing with under the physiologic premise that it might bind an organic toxin that's in their belly and prevent them from absorbing it, and hopefully they won't get as sick and they'll leave the hospital faster versus their attendant aspiration risks of giving charcoal. So the way I, I would, the way I have managed this, given that there still is a general recommendation to give activated charcoal to patients who present within uh, one, or one to two hours, I would say, of a toxin which is uh, adsorbed by charcoal, that you should give them charcoal, provided they've adjust, ingested an amount that is deemed to have the potential to cause toxicity. So something that binds to charcoal they ingest an amount that can potentially cause toxicity, um, and they present within one to two hours. I think it's reasonable to give them a dose of activated charcoal, as long as you think that they're not going to seize, they're able to drink the charcoal on their own, and um, uh, and if they're not, if they have a protected airway, they're already intubated, they've already got an NG tube down. Um, would I ever intubate anybody to give them charcoal? Absolutely not. Would I necessarily force somebody to have an NG tube just so they could drink charcoal? Probably not. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's like it's so it's one gram per kg of charcoal. It's rel it's like it's not a, it's not a ton. It's okay. like yeah, it's a small. It's it's like a glass. It's like a, a cupful basically. Yeah, yeah. It's not a large volume. So like um, I, I have been asked in the past like oh, 
you know, we really want to give them charcoal, but we, we think we need to intubate them and put an NG tube down to do it, I would say uh, not worth it. And then if they're able to drink it on their own and you don't think they're at risk for seizing because they've ingested an agent which is putting them at risk for seizures like, like you know, cocaine or Tegretol or something like that, then go ahead, um, let them drink it. And would I force somebody who is not intubated to have an NG tube just to drink charcoal? Probably not. So the test, testable material for charcoal is they, they ingested an agent which actually binds to charcoal. They came within one to two hours, and you think the amount is significant enough to cause toxicity. So if they, if they tell you I ingested two aspirins, although aspirin is bound to charcoal, it's not worth it to bother giving them charcoal, provided you believe them that they only just. So, um, so who do you avoid activated charcoal in? So not every toxin is bound to activated charcoal. There's a bunch of them that don't bind charcoal, charcoal very well. So there's a mnemonic called FAILS, so activated charcoal FAILS for these agents. So pesticides or petroleum distillates, like basically like solvents, like liquid, so liquid solvents, charcoal is not going to bind them. Uh, acids and alkalis, it's not going to bind them. Uh, heavy metals like lead or things like that, charcoal is not going to bind it. Lithium, which is another metal, not going to be bound. Iron, another metal, not going to be bound. Uh, and then the other ones that I've kind of mentioned already. So at the bottom, you see solvents and seizure risks. So if they're at risk for seizing, just forget about it. Lack of a gag reflex. So again, they need to be able to protect their airway. And one other uh, good one that's in this mnemonic under I is uh, ileus and intestinal obstruction. If the charcoal is not going to go anywhere, because you think that they're on high doses of vasopressors such that they are at risk for having significant ileus, or they have an intestinal obstruction for whatever whatever other reason. Maybe they have a maybe it's, maybe they have, maybe they have a pharmacobezoar or something like that. Don't bother with it. So pesticides, hydrocarbons, metals, acids, alkalis, alcohols, iron, uh, lithium, and solvents. Uh, they don't bind. So environment, so you're, so as far as like the, the E part of the mnemonic, it, assessing temperature dysregulation in your patient is going to be, uh, is going to be an important part of your supportive care approach, which is sometimes easily overlooked when you're, you know, focused on their airway breathing circulation and, and maybe marshalling an antidote if an antidote is applicable for the situation. So um, hypothermia tends to be pretty common in patients who have significant opioid or sedative hypnotic or alcohol uh, overdoses. Um, some of it may be environmentally related that they're simply, because of their depressed sensorium, they're found outside or they're found in a poorly heated home. Uh, but these agents, because of their central effects as well, in particular sedative hypnotics, uh, barbiturates, and opioids, they may have effects on your um, on your body, on your on your hypothalamic, excuse me, on your hypothalamic uh, uh, input regarding temperature regulation, which can contribute to hypothermia. Uh, other agents that we think about less commonly, so carbon monoxide can also be associated with hypothermia, as well as hypoglycemics and uh, large insulin overdoses can also cause hypothermia as well. Hyperthermia is uh, relevant in addition to. Um, for patients that ingest sympathomimetic agents, like hyperthermia is one of the more telling vital sign disturbances in terms of their risk of death. So for cocaine and amphetamines in particular, patients who are hyperthermic tend to do more poorly. Whether it's a cause-effect relationship or an association is unclear, but at least as far as the association goes, it, there's a, there is a step up in your mortality risk associated with hyperthermia and sympathomimetic ingestions. And cooling these patients with cool mist or uh, ice packs, or um, sometimes even ice tank immersion might be uh, an appropriate part of your uh, initial care. So other things to think about as well with hyperthermia is that beyond the beyond the drug itself, you can have um, you can have uh, in, uh, you can have you can have syndromes that are associated with hyperthermia. Serotonin syndrome being uh, something that you will undoubtedly encounter at some point in your career, and NMS. So be on the lookout for patients who are at risk, at risk for serotonin syndrome because of their polyserotonergic medication list or, uh, or NMS if they have neuroleptics on their list as well. Um, enhanced elimination is uh, another thing that is uh, particularly germane to the poison patient. So we talk a lot about different techniques for, an, an, for removing toxin from the body. So enhanced elimination refers to any technique 
that accelerates the elimination of the toxin from the body, whether it's dialysis or urinary alkalinization in the case of aspirin and, uh, to help aid, aid uh, renal elimination. Or you might hear sometimes about multi-dose activated charcoal. So multi-dose activated charcoal is not charcoal that's being given to bind toxin in the gut necessarily. What it's being given for is um, by creating, uh, by giving charcoal recurrently, you will actually pull a uh, drug back across the intestinal epithelium into the gut and bind it to the charcoal and then it gets eliminated. So uh, agents which this has been shown for include um, phenobarbital and the, the way they, uh, the way they actually, the experiments in which they did this for phenobarbital is they actually gave the phenobarbital IV to the people so it never entered their gut and they just gave them uh, multiple doses of activated charcoal and they tracked what their elimination curves were for phenobarbital versus people who did not get charcoal. And the people who got multiple doses of activated charcoal had uh, statistically significantly increased elimination of their uh, phenobarbital. Even though, like I said, phenobarbital was given IV. It was never put into their gut. And the mechanism is that, again, you're, you're pulling drug back across the intestinal epithelium and binding the charcoal and eliminating it. Because these drugs have, um, they have enteroenteric or enterohepatic recirculation, basically. So, so so, so which, which drugs are there that are particularly uh, amenable to these techniques? So multi-dose multi -dose activated charcoal, so phenobarbital is kind of the, the classically used example of that. Some people also use it for Tegretol. I've done that as well. So Tegretol um, also is, is, is amenable to multi-dose activated charcoal. Some of these other agents, aminophilin, theophilin, uh, you won't see as commonly. And there's other techniques we can actually use to get rid of aminophilin, theophilin, that are a little bit uh, less messy than multi-dose activated charcoal. Dapsone and, and, dapsone and quinine are also amenable to multi-dose activated charcoal. Urinary alkalinization, the most testable one is aspirin. You need to know that, that, that if you have a patient with a significant aspirin overdose, if the patient has functional kidneys, um, one, of the t one of the techniques you can employ to increase their elimination of drug will be to alkalinize them with the bicarbonate infusion. So that's, that's usually pretty testable. And then uh, which ones are amenable to being dialyzed? This is also testable. And some of these I suspect you guys already know. So aspirin is, aspirin is very readily cleared by dialysis. The toxic alcohols, methanol, ethylene glycol, very readily cleared by dialysis. So uh, lactic acid due to metformin, I, I have it on there. But uh, good luck convincing any nep nephrologist to do that for you. So some of them, if they believe that metformin has significant renal clearance, uh, excuse me, so, so, some of, so some of the nephrologists, if they believe that metformin has significant CVBH clearance or dialytic clearance, they might do it for you. Uh, I think the answer to that is controversial, and it's probably metformin itself, as far as the drug goes, is probably not very well cleared by CVBH or dialysis. And the lactic acid itself, the way I used to try to sell it is it's just supportive care. This is like, this is a time-limited uh, this is a time-limited toxicity. They're going to stop producing lactic acid. I know that the lactic acid clearance by CVVH itself is lousy. It's, it's, it's very poor. But um, um, unlike a patient with you know, ischemic gut who's not going to stop producing lactic acid until they have a definitive management of their ischemic gut, the patient with metformin toxicity has, is going to have a time limit toxicity. Once they eliminate the drug, their lactic acid will tamp, their lactic acid production will tamp down. So if you need to support their um, acid-based homeostasis with dialysis or renal replacement, renal replacement for a temporary period of time, sometimes you can prevail upon the nephrologist to dot, to put them on CBD for lactic acidosis in this context. But uh, I found that to be um, very difficult to sometimes get them to do that. And if they think that metformin is cleared by CBVH sometimes they'll do it, but otherwise not. But uh, other other drugs which uh, are also cleared by hemodialysis that are a little bit less commonly encountered, uh, theophylline uh, and aminophilin, you can clear them with dialysis uh, as well. That's why I don't see uh, multi-dose activated charcoal used for those drugs so much, in addition to the fact that they're not so commonly employed as uh, therapeutic agents anymore. And valproic acid. So valproic acid, if you have a level over 1,000, so somebody's encephalopathic, hyperaminemic, 
and their valproic acid levels over 1,000, that, that's a patient I would probably push the nephrologist to dialyze them. And you can actually remove valproic acid pretty easily, correct their acidosis, remove some of their ammonia all at the same time. So. Um, charcoal hemoperfusion is a technique that has been um, endorsed in the past to remove drugs from the circulation that are highly protein bound. So dialysis is not very good at removing drugs that are highly protein bound in the, circul in the, in the blood compartment. Uh, charcoal hemoperfusion has theoretical benefits in that regard. Uh, and drugs that we historically used to employ for theophylline, barbiturates, carbamazepine. Uh, if you've ever seen charcoal hemoperfusion done, let me know about it. If you have a charcoal hemoperfusion cartridge at your institution, let me know about it. What would we call for that? Renal or it's, renal? So I, I doubt Loyola has a charcoal hemoperfusion cartridge. The only, so like when I was a toxicology fellow, the only place that had cartridges was, was Rush. That's the only place that they either had to what service to deal with Renal, that? renal. It's usually renal. Oh, okay. It's usually renal. Yeah, so you basically, you basically the, the hookup is like a, a dialysis machine oh. hookup. So you need, a, you need a Quentin and a dialysis machine type of setup. And then there's charcoal cartridges in the circuit, essentially. And essentially, the, the blood is going in. Um, Protein-bound drug is getting pulled off of the protein and stuck onto your charcoal column. And then, yeah. Um, but... Like I said, Rush, like when I was a toxicology fellow, Rush was the only place in the city that had cartridges. Everybody else was like, we don't have any. So. And the workaround is that a lot of these drugs in, if so there's nephrologists that will argue that in the era of modern um, high flux hemodialysis membranes and CVVH, uh, the filtration techniques they use for CVVH and then for dialysis, for straight dialysis, the high flux dialysis membranes, that the clearance you get with those techniques rivals just charcoal hemoperfusion, so you know, it doesn't even matter that we don't have cartridges. If we want to get try to get the drug, we can try to use um, just CVVH with, uh, with, uh, or uh, high flux dialysis. So, focus therapies. So antidotes. So there's not so there's not too many drugs for which we have antidotes, which is why supportive care. Uh, highlighting the elements we've talked about so far and some more to come is going to be the cornerstone of therapy. But there are, uh, as you as you guys, you guys are aware, toxins for which we have very, for which we have fairly effective antidotes. And uh, some of these are more testable than others. So for acetaminophen, you guys are all aware that N-acetylcysteine is an effective antidotal therapy. This has been well demonstrated in experimental studies going back two to two or three decades now. Uh, but beyond an acetylcysteine for acetaminophen, uh, for toxic alcohols, uh, for, for, methyl, for methylpyrazole or fomepazole, which is an alcohol dehydrogenase blocker, is, is testable and something that people will kind of expect you to know that you have a patient with um, osmol gap, anion gap acidosis, who you are suspicious is having, uh, who's suspicious is, um, having acidosis secondary to methanol, ethane glycol ingestion, that uh, uh, alcohol dehydrogenase blockade with fomepazole should be instituted. That's, uh, that's important to know. For carbon monoxide, uh, people have talked about the role of hyperbaric oxygen in enhancing the eliminate or in accelerating the decline of carboxyhemoglobin levels in the human bloodstream. The role of uh, hyperbaric oxygen has been touted for decades now. The problem is that the experimental data is is conflicted in terms of whether it actually changes your clinical outcome. The clinical outcome of interest for hyperbaric oxygen being, does it prevent um, brain injury and, yeah, and, uh, and, and, and cognitive or neuropsychiatric sequelae secondary to carbon monoxide uh, poison? Nobody's even trying to argue death prevention from carbon monoxide. They're, they're, what they're arguing is, does it prevent brain injury, cognitive sequelae, or neuropsychiatric stuff? And even for that, like the data experimentally, in, in, at least in human studies, is back and forth. And uh, some people are starting to argue that um, unless it's like a pregnant woman or um, pregnant woman or a patient who has uh, significantly depressed sensorium, meaning they're like abundant or comatose with a, with a high carboxyhemoglobin level, they're not going to refer them for uh, hyperbarics now. They're just going to do standard care with with a uh, high FiO2 oxygen at the institution. So, so why would uh, you know, carboxy level? Yeah. Is it an indication by itself if it's like 10, 20 percent? So if it, so it's like if it, Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I was just wondering 
Like yeah. If it's five percent or less or ten percent, you don't use it. Yeah. But in some in certain situations, they say if it's like 20, 30, 50, 20 yeah. or twenty or twenty five percent, you probably get. I mean, so, I don't. Yeah. Know. So 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 people are so the I would say that most people would still argue that if the patient is pregnant and they have a level that's like above like even 15, 20%, that they would at least refer for hyperbarics. And if the hyperbaric people say, uh, do not transfer, then fine, do not transfer. And if the patient has is uh, obtunded or altered when you see them, yeah. and, and they have a level more than 20 to 30%, I would still refer those people and, and let the hyperbaric chamber say take or not take. But leaving those populations aside um, for an adult, who's not pregnant and doesn't have significantly altered sensorium, when I see them, like forget about if they syncopize before they came, like e people are even discounting that now. You syncopize before you came, discount it. Um, a lot of people are saying there's probably not much point in referring those people for hyperbarics. But usually if it's about 20%, the patient will go like, No, not like necessarily, that. yeah. Yeah, not necessarily. And with high oxygen, would you ever intubate them to give them 100% you're just talking about so yeah, so I I so usually if they're awake alert, I put an armor breather on them and just follow the level. And it usually it will, it will. I mean, you're talking about you're talking about you're talking about ninety minutes versus for for reduct for half. For, you're talking about a ninety minute half time for the level for somebody that's getting a non rebreather oxygen, um, or hundred percent FiO two simply. Versus, if you if you theoretically sent them for hyperbarics and they got hyperbaric oxygen, you're talking about like like tens of minutes basically. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But um, for carbon monoxide, like the ones I would say are still like being pushed, even though the, the data for hyperbarics is kind of becoming increasingly questionable, is pregnant people or people who are obtunded or comatose when you see them. Yeah. Um, uh, opioids, we know naloxone works well. <laughs> Anticholinergics. So you see, so physostigmine. So how does physostigmine work? It's an acetylcholinase aspirase inhibitor. So essentially, it inhibits the break breakdown of acetylcholine. So if you have a patient who's ingested uh, anticholinergic like Benadryl or something of that nature, and if you were to give them physostigmine, theoretically, you would have additional acetylcholine hanging around. It would be perhaps be able to overcome the receptor blockade. Um, the question is, what's the point of doing that for a anticholinergic overdose? Um, because uh, we know that most anticholinergic overdoses, they do very well with supportive care. You don't necessarily need to give them physostigmine to make them have a better outcome. So what's the point of doing that? Some people have argued that if you have a patient who is altered <laughs> and hyperthermic, from uh, anticholinergic overdose, so big, large Benadryl overdose that can be tachycardic, hypertensive, hyperthermic, altered, um, and if you're not sure why that is, and you're con contemplating uh, LPing them to rule out meningitis and cephalitis, I have seen on one occasion, physostigmine given, the patient is becomes normal, like everything normalizes for about 30 minutes or so, and they can tell you. They can give you a history, their vital sign abnormalities are all, and they tell you what they did. And then once the physostigmine wears off, they go back to the way, the way they were usually. It can potentially uh, reduce the need, the need for invasive testing, like LPs, for example. So that's the only reason I can kind of think about doing it. Um, in the past, people did crazy things like physostigmine drips to keep these people um, normal until their Benadryl worked its way out of their system. I, I think that's uh, probably not merited since most of these people do pretty well with, without the without physostigmine and just straight supportive therapy. Um, organophosphates, uh, pesticides, as well as uh, nerve agents. So like nerve gases and nerve agents, which which sometimes come up in the context of testing as potential agents of terrorism, um, as well as organophosphates, they have the same kind of uh, mechanism of action. They essentially deactivate your acetylcholine esterase. So they, 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 by deactivating your acetylcholine esterase, you have a huge um, surge in your body levels of acetylcholine. So people are usually drowning in their own secretions. They have bronchorrhea, copious secretions, um, and uh, respiratory distress related to that. For that, this is testable. So the, the treatment for those guys is you give them atropine till their airway is dry and 
uh, and you give them pralidoxime, which is uh, 2-PAM, which is an agent which, in certain circumstances, can reactivate their acetylcholine esterase enzyme and thereby return their endogenous acetylcholine levels towards normal. Um, for met hemoglobinemia, you guys know methylene blue can be used to potentially uh, reverse met hemoglobinemia. Cyanide is uh, uh, an important one to talk about because uh, you, it, is not, it is not outside the realm of possibility for you guys to counter cyanide poisoning. Do you know what's the most likely setting in which you guys are going to, you guys will see it? So that's one. So nitroprusside infusion is one, and there's another one that you guys will. will Nope. So nitroprusside, in, in this day and age, where pharmacists are like hyper vigilant about it, you're, you you might see it, but it's less likely. There's one that's yeah, probably so more likely. So patient with um, uh, patients intubated from a fire and smoke inhalation injury, that's the other one that you'll see it. So um, most common source of cyanide exposure for the general population plastics. is going to be yeah burning plastics exactly. So patient who is in a house fire burning plastics. They can get the double whammy of carbon monoxide poisoning plus cyanide poisoning from plastics, in addition to thermal injury to their airway and lungs and the associate, uh, associated consequences of just straight thermal injury to the lungs. Um, for, the, for the carbon monoxide component of it, you have a test that you can readily get. You get a blood gas with coaxymetry, you have their, you have their carboxyhemoglobin level. What can you get as a surrogate for a cyanide level? A cyanide level will come back in three days. As, well, if you're lucky a day, maybe three days. So there's a surrogate you can get for your cyanide level. And this has been kind of borne out when studied in uh, victims of fires. So how does cyanide work? It's a, it's a, it's a mitochondrial respiration toxin, and you can't make... Lac so yeah, lactic acid. So yeah, so they tend to have very high lactates that are not really explained by their circulatory. Well, so they actually I, I take that back. So they can have circulatory perturbances. They can have uh, tachycardia, hypotension, shock, and things of that nature. But um, they tend to have lactic acidosis, and lactic acid tends to be the surrogate for their their cyanide level. In terms of antidotal therapy, people used to talk about that Lily kit, which is you. It, it has a it has a nitrate to, excuse me, it has a, it has a, it has a nitrite to induce uh, met hemoglobinemia. The reason why is because uh, met hemoglobin has a much higher affinity for cyanide than your regular hemoglobin does. So it basically pulls cyanide off your red blood cells and it sticks them on to um, essentially carbon carbamino met hemoglobin. And then the second part of the Lily kit. Uh, beyond the nitrite was like a uh, sodium thiocyanate essentially, and that purpose of that is to enhance the elimination of this uh, of this cyanide moiety from this uh, carbon amino met hemoglobin essentially. Um, the good news is that um, most institutions now they have a much more uh, elegant and less clumsy uh, antidote for cyanide patients than the Lily kit. Um, yeah, I, yeah, exactly. Hydroxycobol. Yeah. So most institutions in the United States have that now. It's um, it's pretty easy to give. It's less clumsy than the Lily kit, and it, the, the there isn't much systemic toxicity. There's like like the the biggest problem with the hydroxycobol in it is it interferes with some lab tests because it's a very it's a very pigmented drug essentially. So some of your lab tests, like for bilirubin and things like that, they depend on spectrophotometry. And it inter interferes with that for a brief period of time until the drug winds its way out of your system, and your one and once the drug is out of your system, once the hydroxycobalamin is out of your system, this issue of lab interference is resolved. But in terms of like a remedy for cyanide poisoning, it's, it's easy to give, tends to be rapidly effective, and uh, so much so that if you go to France, for example, if you're in a house fire, they'll just and you're unconscious after a house fire. And you have evidence of smoke inhalation, they'll just give it to you empirically. Mm -hmm. So, cyanide basically, lactic acid is your surrogate for toxicity, and then your remedies are the lily kit, which is a nitrite and sodium thiocyanate, or uh, hydroxycobalamin, essentially. So. And then, Iron, arsenic, lead, mercury, these are a little bit more esoteric chelating agents that I don't think you guys will be tested on so much. Uh, for digoxin, though, uh, 
Uh, anybody, how many of you have given Digivine to some point? So, two, one, three. That's not too bad. So, yeah, you guys have given Digivine. Um, it's clearly, uh, aside from the risk of a rare, rare anaphylactoid or allergic reaction to the fab drug, it's like a very, very clean therapy. Um, no side effects, and it removes your digoxin basically from the uh, from the table as far as an agent of toxicity within minutes. It's like a very elegant therapy for patients who think are having dig toxicity. And obviously, we have dig levels that we can get on a relatively timely basis to help guide this. So, um, glucagon for beta blockers is another one that we talk about uh, frequently, and we can debate the efficacy of it. But it's good to know since people will still test you guys about uh, if you have a patient with beta blocker overdose or a patient who's having anaphylaxis and is not responsive to epinephrine in the context of beta blockade uh, chronically with their home medications, what would you consider adding to your anaphylaxis treatment? And usually they're fishing for you guys to say glucagon is what I would consider giving this anaphylaxis patient who's not responding to my epi and my standard anaphylaxis management. Um, tricyclic antidepressants. Tricyclic antidepressants are essentially a sodium channel uh, sodium channel a toxin or sodium channel blocking drug. So sodium bicarbonate is often touted as an antidotal therapy for that. Calcium channel antagonists, uh, insulin dextrose, high dose insulin more specifically is sometimes efficacious. And then for the sulfonylureas, octreotide sub-Q can be effective as well as obviously giving uh, dextrose for patients who are overtly hypoglycemic and glucagon can be useful as well provided they have glycogen stores. Um, and we talked about this briefly already. So at Loyola, we have, uh, in terms of getting help and marshalling additional resources, we have toxicology, I guess Dr. Hanch is a, as available as a consultant. You have pharmacists as well. If you're in an environment where you don't have in-house pharmacy or toxicology help to marshal, then there's always a state poison control center, which can be very helpful with uh, uh, marshalling rare antidotes. Uh, if you have a patient who's been bitten by a snake or exotic animal, they can be poison control centers often maintain stockpile lists of who has what antivenom where for which zoo in your state may have the antivenom or can be able to use to procure the antivenom. So like, uh, for example, people have had like, like random cobras and gaboon vipers in Chicago and have been bitten by their pets <laughs> and you, are, you call the poison control center and say, which zoo might have antivenom where so they can actually help you. Help you get a hold of it. No, you go to the hospital. And the, obviously, the hospital is calling the zoo, saying, "Give us your, give us your vial." Who goes and picks that out? Yeah, what? Who goes and picks it out from the zoo? Illinois State, uh, Illinois State Police did it once. Oh. Yeah. So we sent Illinois State Police once to go get, go get the, the antivenom from the zoo. Do you get on the primary care? Hospital, yeah. Have like stocks of antivenom. We're in in India. Yeah, of course, because it's a much more common problem there. Here, here, because it's random people, crazy people with random <laughs> exotic pets. It's the zoo, and then the zoo have if they have it, you can have stuff. It likes the Illinois State Police or when we want it brought it one time from the zoo to the hospital. Um, the other thing is uh, pill, I pill identification is a nice one to kind of talk about too. So a lot of pills have inscriptions on them. And uh, the inscriptions, which are usually numbers or letters or some code uh, thereof, uh, can, if you, if you ask the poison control center or sometimes even your in-house pharmacist, they can, they can often tell you, oh, this pill is this, this drug based off of the inscription. So that's a nice trick if you have a, a pill to, to use to figure out what exactly they took. So what do you do when you're not able to figure out what, what they took? So the patient's history is inadequate because they're altered or unable to provide history. You asked the family or EMS, you tried to get pharmacy records and you couldn't figure it out. So historically, you know, or people talked about toxidromes and recognizing these toxidromes based off of some constellation of signs and symptoms to help you identify which agent was ingested. And classically, they talked about like five sometimes uh, six toxidromes. Like with, withdrawal is the one that sometimes people don't count as a toxidrome, but if you count withdrawal, there's six. So an anticholinergic toxidrome, cholinergic toxidrome, sympathomimetic toxidrome, an opioid toxidrome, and an ethanol sedative hypnotic toxidrome. So 
although there's a variety of vital sign abnormalities in terms of uh, blood pressure, pulse, respiration, temperature, pupil size, uh, presence, or presence or absence of sweat that have been described in order to kind of help tease these apart. The caveat I'll put on this is that um, it only works well as a rough guide to kind of what group of toxin they might have taken. Like for example, how do you tell apart an anticholinergic and a sympathomimetic toxidural? Because both of them can cause elevated blood pressure, elevated temperature, elevated heart rate, um, and altered sensorium. So what tells them apart? You know, people classically used to say, well, patients who ingest sympathomimetics, they tend to be very sweaty, they have axillary sweat, whereas people who, do, who ingest anticholinergics, they don't have, you know, sweat and they're not diaphoretic, so that, that's what tells them apart. And the anticholinergic people, they'll have, you know, urinary retention and dry mucous membranes and maybe things like that will tell them apart. The problem is that at the bedside, I don't know if it works that well and I don't know how helpful it is at, at making these fine distinctions at the bedside. It can help give you a rough clue as to what's going on, that maybe it's a sympathomimetic ingestion or an anticholinergic ingestion since they're tachycardic, hypertensive, hyper, hyperpyrexic, and so on. Um, and the reality is that even though historically people touted these toxidromes as the bedside tool to employ when dealing with an unknown ingestion, um, clinically, if you focus your supportive care on airway breathing circulation, temperature dysregulation management, and uh, uh, work towards addressing these issues, I, I personally, this is my opinion, fail to see how the recognition, recognition of a discrete toxidrome aids you above and beyond that, um, that uh, ABC, uh, DE, like focused supportive care approach, which is more innate to us based off of the fact that we employ a uh, similar thought process in a variety of forms of critical illness. So. The other big confounder for toxidromes is that patients who ingest uppers and downers at the same time, so a patient who ingests a bunch of cocaine and a bunch of benzos, um, they're not going to have necessarily a clean, like, sympathomimetic toxidrome or a clean benzodiazepine sedative hypnotic toxidrome. So. Um, uh, and then Patients, same, similarly, patients who ingest opioids and cocaine or amphetamines at the same time, it's not, it's not going to be a clean one or the other toxidrome. So um, people like to talk about toxidromes as the classically employed tool for helping you tease out what they might have taken if you don't know and can't figure it out. But again, I think their bedside utility is questionable. So, um, in, 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 some of these things are probably a little bit less less relevant for us, but these are things that we used to talk about as far as clues for the recognizing the different toxidromes. So anticholinergic toxidrome, some of these things we've, t we've discussed, they tend to have dry skin, dilated pupils, altered sensorium with delirium and hallucinations. They tend to be hyperthermic. Cholinergic, um, the, 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 this one, I think because they tend to put it on tests where they want you to figure out the patient is exposed to like a nerve agent for uh, terrorism or an organophosphate. They tend to have copious secretions, so bronchorrhea, bronchospasm, urination, uh, diarrhea, lacrimation, lethargy, salivation. So that tends to be a good, good, good way to remember cholinergic toxidromes. There's also a nicotinic uh, component of cholinergic toxidromes. So if you have acetylcholine sticking to nicotinic receptors, then these seizures, tachycardia, medriasis, tremors, and fasciculations, these neuromuscular things tend to be a little bit more prominent versus the muscarinic ones with secretions uh, being more prominent. Um, as far as uh, like laboratory testing that you should consider getting in patients who are uh, being worked up for poisoning, um, some of these tests are more useful than others. Uh, I think the standard ones that we get, electrolytes, bicarb levels, BUN, creatinine, glucose, they can help uh, aid in diagnosis sometimes, but more, more importantly, they can potentially guide your supportive care. Blood gas analysis is, is as you guys all know, it can be useful in analyzing patients who have suspected acid-base disturbances. Other things that you shouldn't forget is uh, pregnancy testing in females of childbearing age. Um, uh, ingestion and overdose are not uncommon problems amongst pregnant women. Sometimes uh, agents are being, ingested, are being ingested as abortifacents because the pregnancy is unwanted. And uh, this can, this, the, the presence of a fetus 
can also alter your management, like we talked about for carbon for carbon monoxide. If a pregnant woman is still somebody who a lot of people would prefer for hyperbaric therapy, even though the efficacy is questionable. Uh, and then consider uh, Tylenol and acetaminophen levels in all of your suicidal ingestions. Uh, they tend to be very, very common co-ingestants because acetaminophen and salicylates are very, very commonly found in most households. So. Are there any answers that we need So that's a really good question. So the one, the ones that people uh, hesitate about the most is like the chelating agents or uh, metals uh, and giving those to pregnant pe people because uh, there's essentially no good data on them. And for most, for, for most pregnant people, with the exception of lead chelating agents, some of the chelating agents for lead have better data in young children and pregnant women. But um, the, the reality is that even though there isn't good data regarding their safety, none of them have been shown to be, none of them, let me think carefully. Most, most of the commonly employed antidotes, even the heavy metal chelating agents, to the best of my knowledge, none of them have been shown to be abortifacients. And the reality is that if a patient is, if a, it's a pregnant patient's dying from, yeah, from something, then you got to save mom to save the fetus. Yeah. Um, we, we talk about anion gaps very commonly. You guys know most of these mnemonics for things that cause anion gap acidosis, uh, and uh, the only thing I can add is that the, there's a me, there's a me die mnemonic for osmol gap, methanol, ethylene glycol, uh, mannitol, and diabetic ketoacidosis as the D, isopropyl alcohol, and ethanol for the I and the E. Uh, isopropyl alcohol uh, as, is the the other like uh, often uh, bit of often small bit of trivia that people like to test about. So. Can you blame a huge anion gap acidosis on isopropyl alcohol? So somebody drinks rubbing alcohol. That's what isopropyl alcohol is. And you can have, you, you have high osmolar gap. Yeah. But you don't. You don't. You may not have anion gap. Yeah. Acidosis. So you. So you. That's the, yeah. That's the distinction. So you. So you can't. You can't pin a huge anion gap acidosis on isopropyl alcohol. Somebody tells you that they drink all they drink is rubbing alcohol and they have a huge anion gap. That the story is not right. You need to think for usually methanol or ethylene glycol. Yeah, so uh, isopropyl alcohol is metabolized to acetone. Acetone is a non-ionizable ketone, so it doesn't cause anion gap acidosis. Um, whereas methanol is metabolized to formic acid, which is ionizable and does cause anion gap acidosis. Ethylene glycol is metabolized to uh, glycolic acid, oxalic acid, which are ionizable and do cause anion gap acidosis. All right, so. My my uh, the slide that generates the most controversy and uh, is it tends to be the most revealing for a lot of people. So, drug screens. So, getting a routine like qualitative drug screen like the urine drug screen where it's positive negative for a variety of uh, variety of uh, street drugs and some pharmaceutical agents as well, um, is a very controversial topic in terms of the clinical utility. And the reasons why is because uh, most urine drug screens are fraught with false negatives and false positives. And the presence of a substance in the urine does not necessarily imply that it is causing the clinical presentation that you see in front of you. Why? Because the metabolites which are being detected by the urine drug screen may be the product of an ingestion that occurred five days ago. So it doesn't mean that that's what's causing the toxicity in front of you, although people tend to focus in once they see, oh, it's a positive amphetamine screen that the patient is the way they are because they took a bunch of amphetamines. Uh, and urine drug screens, although their, their use tends to be discouraged as a routine test in cases of suspected overdose, the, the problem is that they are nonetheless very commonly uh, ordered and most people are, don't know how to interpret them really well because they don't realize that there's a ton of false positives and false negatives. So having said that, um, the ones that are pretty reliable is, so the, the urine drug screen, if it's positive for THC, it tends to be pretty reliable, but who cares because most people are not dying from, you know, have from marijuana when you see them. But if it's positive for cocaine, that's usually very, uh, very good, uh, very good uh, sensitivity and very good specificity. So if, if it's positive for cocaine, they did cocaine at some point, whether it was today or three days ago is a different question, but 
it's cocaine, it's not something else that they may claim it may be. Um, and opioids, if it's positive, it helps you. It's pro they probably did truly get exposed to an opioid. Again, whether it's today or three days ago is a, is a different question, but an opioid screen being negative doesn't necessarily mean that they didn't take an opioid. So do you guys know why that is? So I have some, so fentanyl, fentanyl, meperidine, methadone, propoxyphene. Propoxyphene is gone from the market now. Tramadol, they're all opioids, but none of them are going to make your urine drug screen pop positive. Do you guys know why? Because it's the way they get metabolized and secreted. That's part of it. That's part of it. So the reason why is because your urine drug screen is built to detect uh, morphine. So it detects codeine and morphine. Well, codeine is essentially metabolized to morphine-related compounds. So it detects codeine, morphine very well. That's what it's built to detect. It detects drugs that are structurally related to morphine fairly well, and drugs that are entirely unrelated to morphine and structure, like fentanyl, methadone, oxycodone, uh, oxycodone even, and tramadol, you need to test for those things specifically. They're not going to make a urine drug chain pop positive most of the time. So if, it's, if, a, if a urine drug chain is positive for opioids, they were exposed to an opioid very likely within some period of time uh, recently. But the presence of a false urine drug screen for an opioid does not rule it out. What could you do to actually tease that out if you have a clinical suspicion that the patient has op ingested an opioid based off of your exam? They're, they're bradypneic and have pinpoint pupils, excuse me. So there's pretty easy bedside test you could do to tease it out, even if the urine drug screen is negative. Yeah, exactly. Give them a so If they wake up and they have an unequivocal response where they're up and talking to you within seconds, that they took an opioid. Doesn't matter if the urine screen is negative. Yeah. And this is another one that's that's revealing. So benzos, um, a lot of people don't know that uh, clonazepam and even Ativan and Xanax are not going to necessarily make your urine drug screen pop up positive. And the reason why is because the 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 urine drug screen uh, benzo detection is built to detect um, oxazepam. It's built to detect, which is a little bit odd, but the structure of oxazepam, which is also known as Cirax, that's what it detects the best. It will detect Valium and Valium metabolites and Librium and some of those Librium metabolites very well. But some of these other uh, benzos, unless you do some manipulations to the urine specimen to try to um, enhance the elimination of light, excuse me, unless you do some manipulations to the urine specimen to enhance the detection of things like Ativan, most of the, most of the time clonazepam, Ativan, and Xanax, they, they, they can very easily be a false negative on your urine drug screen. Quick so, question, yeah. what opioid is present on heroin, or is it variable? So her, her, heroin is diacetylmorphine, so it gets, it gets metabolized to morphine. So it'll be detected. It'll be, it'll be, it'll be detected. That's yeah. the one yeah. that probably we worry. Yeah, so heroin will be detected. So diacetylmorphine and heroin will get detected. Yeah. It's very, very close to the structure of the morphine. Um, fentanyl, which is now being sucked into a lot of heroin, will not get detected so well. So uh, I think we ha I think we had definitely had one uh, case at night where it was like a old, old might have been, was it your team that got me? It was like the old lady who like swore she didn't take anything and was like found slumped over sitting on the toilet at home. And they, they, they basically, she was like intubated in the field and they gave her a bunch of Narcan and ER here and she woke up. And they, and she, and they took out. And she said, I didn't take anything, I didn't take anything. And the urine drug was negative, so we said, I don't know if But no, she like woke up and like gave her no answer. Can you ask specifically to check these in the urine? So you can. It'll be a send out. It'll be a so send out. It yeah. Possible? Yeah, it's possible. It'll be send out. What? So it cost cost and yield. So you could so theoretically you could make the urine drug screen better by doing um, you could do you could do sophisticated analyses to detect small amounts of drugs like uh, fentanyl. They tend to be present in smaller concentrations as far as their parent compound and the metabolites go because the doses of fentanyl are in the microgram range as opposed to the milligram range. So you could use sophisticated analytic techniques like uh, uh, like gas chromatography, mass spectroscopy to detect these, these compounds in the urine or their related metabolites. The problem is that you'd make a urine drug really expensive to do. Yeah. 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 So uh, having said that, there are hospitals where because they deal with methadone and oxycodone so often, 
that they've, they've stuck those specific analytes onto the VUM prep screen when you were the generic VUM prep screen there. There's like a methadone path and a oxybutyl path. And there's like a lot of that already in there. So, so. Um, if you see a, a amphetamine positive or amphetamine negative drug screen, so there's so many false negatives for the amphetamines, it's not even funny because there's so many chemical uh, compound variations of amphetamines based off of sticking a uh, sticking a functional group here or a functional group there onto the molecule that can make the drug screen negative that it, it's 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 almost a laughable test when it comes to amphetamines and there's so many drugs that make the amphetamine screen false falsely positive so here's amphetamines on the uh, the your drug screen and here's all the agents that can cause false positives for amphetamines so this is like a huge list of all these things that could cause amphetamines false positives um, so um, if I see a false positive amphetamine screen, I usually don't assume it's an amphetamine unless they're like so clearly synthetomimetically toxic, it's not even funny. And then if, if, if somebody tells me they took ecstasy and the amphetamine screen is negative, I, I believe the patient that yes, you took ecstasy even though your amphetamine screen is negative. So. You might just have dirt. Yeah. So note, note, that, note that for cocaine, which I told you, highest sensitivity, high specificity of all the commonly tested things on a urine drug screen. The false positives are coca leaf tea, which has cocaine in it, so it's not really a false positive, and topical anesthetics containing cocaine, which again is you were exposed to cocaine. That's why your urine drug screen is positive. It's not, it's not really a false positive. Mm -hmm. so. um, uh, PCP or fencyclidine. PCP uh, or fencyclidine is also part of uh, the commonly employed urine drug screens that a lot of institutions is also subject to a lot of the false positive, false negative issues that amphetamines are subject to. So anyway, bottom line is we order a lot of urine drug screens and you, unless you know how to interpret them, um, it's very easy to get thrown off in terms of uh, what, in terms of understanding what's going on with your patient if you go by the urine drug screen data. So quantitative blood tests, which uh, you can get sometimes in a timely manner to help guide the management of specific patients, these are a different beast. Um, the reason why is because they tend to be very specific uh, analytical assays for that specific agent. So the issue of false positives and false negatives tends to be much more contained. Uh, so commonly available quantitative levels, so Tylenol, aspirin we know about, we can use them to help guide our therapy at the bedside. Theophylline tends to be commonly available. I'm not so sure about Loyola. Lithium, lead, iron, digoxin, carboxyhemoglobin levels, methemoglobin levels, and then of course anticonvulsants tend to have commonly available drug levels that can help you guide guide your therapy. And then these get so basically in addition to uh, your your bedside uh, assessment, laboratory testing additional data that you may want to gather can include an EKG, many of the toxins we frequently encounter, such as psychotropic drugs and antidepressants, and of course the cardioactive agents can cause EKG and conduction abnormalities. These conduction abnormalities can be sometimes be associated with, with dysrhythmias, such as torsades, QRS, wide, wide, wide QRS complex tachydysrhythmias, and the management of these um, can be uh, the management of these can be addressed with certain pharmacologic agents. For example, QRS widening can often guide the use of uh, sodium bicarbonate as a therapy for specific agents. Uh, tricyclic antidepressants, cocaine being uh, among the more common ones that we can uh, think about using sodium bicarbonate for to treat QRS widening. And then QT prolongation, uh, we know that this can increase your risk of torsades. It can be associated with antidepressants and antidysrhythmic drugs as, as well as other um, pharmaceutical agents. And this is uh, uh, the use of radiography in poisoning. So sometimes a KUB x-ray can help detect the presence of certain drugs, mostly um, radiopaque metals like iron. So if people have ingested a bunch of iron or ingested lead, these are, these are radiopaque things that can be identified in the stomach on KUB if they still have metal present in their stomach. The reason why you care is theoretically you could decontaminate that patient if they have radiopaque uh, material still present in their stomach. Uh, chest x-ray. So there's a mnemonic for, for, there's a mnemonic for drugs that are known to be associated with uh, lung injury and ARDS. 
the ones that I think that people talk about the most is opioids and salicylates. These are associated with uh, lung injury, ARDS, and overdose.